Um, my name is Phil Sturgeon. I, um, I'm a Brit living in New York, so my accent's probably getting a little bit funny. And um, I work for WeWork, a company that has more APIs than I could possibly count. Um, we've kind of grown from uh, a lot of people that are used to writing monoliths or writing kind of, um, as I was saying, uh, writing kind of the one generic API to a company that suddenly has loads of APIs all sat next to each other. So we kind of naturally evolved into having a service oriented architecture um, or potentially a microservice based system um, without really planning it or expecting it or realizing what that would entail. So. Um, I saw this quote a little while ago, and it's, if you switch off one of the microservices and, and, uh, and, and anything else breaks, you don't have a microservice architecture, you just have a distributed monolith, right? Um, so just having one system with a bunch of endpoints or having lots of systems that all rely on each other with you know, a few of those endpoints per system, that doesn't really mean you have microservice architecture, it just means you have this, this big monolith running on different servers. That's not really a situation you want to be in. So just to get this out of the way, um, synchronous requests are the devil. If you are uh, building, you know, you have a backend application that talks to another backend application, and maybe that is talking to another backend application, if that's all happening synchronously, that's terrible. This whole talk is about how to make that work in the least painful way possible, but I have to, have to point out that you just should try and avoid doing that whenever possible. Um, the, uh, the things you can do to avoid it are to offload work via Sidekick or AM, AMQP kind of message systems like Rabbit. Um, if you can do that and just do the work later, you're golden. Uh, you can return a 201 accepted in your API and then you can just kind of uh, communicate some way uh, to the client to let them know that they can subscribe to changes somehow. And you can do that with uh, web hooks, long polling potentially, um, or, or web sockets, which are a little bit different. So with that kind of disclaimer out of the way, um, this is a common pattern. Let's just ignore network latency for the minute and we will um, we'll say that service A wants to be done within 300 milliseconds and, um, and it, it has 50 milliseconds worth of stuff to do. Service B usually responds within 200 milliseconds and um, on a good day, that means within you know, 250 milliseconds, 300 somewhere, the client has its answer, right? Um, common problem, though, is a network graph like this, or a response time graph like this. Anyone seen this on, on New Relic? Yeah? It's, uh, it's like, oh, it's mostly fine. I mean, something happened, but it's mostly fine. Um, <laughs> this is a symptom of a much larger problem. So what happens when service B, instead of taking the normal 200 milliseconds, decides to take 10 seconds, right? We, we have a bit of an issue here. Uh, this is mostly because service A is giving service B far too much, like, far too much of a leash. Uh, they're giving it enough rope to hang itself with, right? We I can just shout. <laughs> um, there we go, I'm back. So we saw this happening. Hello, right. We, we used to use Runscape traffic, which gave us, um, uh, it's like a proxy that records times, and we had this one service uh, that was a third-party service that was taking two, two and a half minutes to fail. <laughs> um, and we didn't have timeouts. Like, no, nothing in WeWork anywhere had any timeouts. Like, no one knew what the word timeout meant. So um, I, we had to kind of learn about that and, and, and fix that. So most things won't take two and a half minutes. If you're using Heroku, anyone Heroku for their services? Okay, you are safe-ish because... Um, so there's something I refer to as the Heroku chop, where it will automatically turn off web processes after 30 seconds, much like this microphone. Um, so basically, uh, you will quite often see on, uh, on New Relic or systems like that, um, and you'll see a lot of transaction traces that are around about that 30 second mark, um, just under or just over. That means that you, know, you have some funky process that's going on forever, um, and it's chopping at 30. But that's quite rare. Not all servers do that. If you're not on Heroku, you probably don't have that. Um, so you could be lasting for minutes. And what happens when that service B that we talked about earlier, um, when that has suddenly split out some of its functionality into service C and D, two more systems, even if one of those systems is taking 50 milliseconds and the other one is taking 30 milliseconds, that still means that service B is in total waiting for 30 seconds. Um, and then your client is stuck waiting for that much time as well. And if it took 30 seconds to chop and get a failure, that means your client spent 30 seconds waiting to be told that something didn't work. 
that's pretty annoying. But if they wait another 30 seconds after clicking that button again, they are never coming back to your website. They spent a minute just getting two no's. That's not good. Um, so to understand how this can look, because it, people often think about this like this one failure, like or, or maybe a small number of failures, right? Like if those timeouts are happening, maybe maybe that one request failed, or maybe like a you know one percent of requests fail, but they forget to realize how that can have a cumulative effect on your entire traffic. Um, if we think about an oversimplified. Uh, uh, server. Say there's literally only six workers on your server. You know how you have different servers or dynos running, and then each of those dynos has multiple processes running, and then those processes have multiple threads running. Imagine there's only six threads, just so I can fit it on a single page. Um, six requests come into those six threads, and one of them fails. It gets stuck on service B, which is stuck for 30 seconds. And then while that's stuck, more requests are coming in, and some people are requesting other endpoints that don't need service B, so they're okay, they're, they're responding quite quickly. But more requests are coming in, and some of those are getting stuck on the endpoint that requires service B. And over time, you have fewer and fewer until eventually you have zero threads available. And what sucks about that is that there's some endpoints in your system that could work perfectly, but they're all, there's, no tr uh, there's no capacity left to handle those other endpoints because all of your worker threads are stuck on this thing which has a really long timeout on it. This is called a cascading failure, or cat catastrophic cascading failure. Um, and it also means that any clients of your service, uh, or, or the service that are stuck failing, they start to look like this. Has anyone seen this graph, where um, the, the green bit is the request queuing? That means that all of your requests coming in are being queued, because there's no way for them to be handled, because you don't have any threads available. And any service that talks to that service is also stuck. So you just get these giant spikes. And we'd have this at WeWork all the time, where one very important upstream service would have a big old spike in performance, and then every other service has a giant spike in performance. And you can just see it the whole way through. So more numbers, more math. Um, if each thread is getting stuck for 30 seconds, um, and most requests go through in 100 milliseconds, that means for each thread that gets stuck, that's 3,000 requests that you're failing to fulfill. That's a lot. That's 3,000 requests per thread that get stuck. So this is where timeouts get involved. If you were to tell service A, give up after 10 seconds, then that means that it frees up 20 seconds on that thread. You know? So that means that's 2,000 more successful requests that are being resolved just from that one thread giving up a little bit earlier. Now, 10 seconds is still really slow, but we've still got like 2,000 requests happening, and that's, that's a good thing. So setting timeouts is really easy. Most HTTP clients support it. Um, in Faraday, got any Ruby users in the house? OK, um, <laughs> fine. Uh, so normally, it looks like this. There's timeout and open timeout. Open timeout is how long until there's a sign of life from the server saying, like, yep, I'm going to start doing something. You want to set that quite low. And then you have a, a, the timeout in, in general is the open and read timeout. So the read timeout is, OK, I've the, the server started working on stuff. How long until I get the last byte from that server? Um, so there's two different types of timeout. And if you, if you just see the word timeout, it means both of them. So open and read combined. Um, guzzle for PHP. Uh, this, again, is super easy. So now that you know about the concept of timeouts, you have to pick the right timeout. Some people look at New Relic for this, and they see a graph. And you can see that, that one dodgy spike at the front there. We can ignore that. Well, clearly, something went wrong. And some people think, well, look at the biggest spike and put it just above that so we know our requests uh, are going to um, be resolved. But that's the wrong way of doing it. This is an average graph. When you look at New Relic, by default, it's showing you averages. That average is almost entirely useless. Um, you want to click on the little percent icon, and then you'll see your percentiles. So the blue one is just like bad day scenario. Um, yellow is uh, the 95th percentile. Then you have two different types of average at the bottom. Um, so it's nice to know that your average is floating along around about 50 to 80 milliseconds somewhere. Um, but really, we want to look at this 99th uh, percentile. And some people think you should set it at the top, right? So if you look at a month's worth of traffic and it says the slowest response is 800 milliseconds, they might pick 800 milliseconds. But again, you, you don't want to support the, the, the worst case scenario. You want to probably put it somewhere around the 95th percentile. So we might say, if you haven't responded in 350 or 400 milliseconds, then give up, because it's only real edge cases that take 800 milliseconds. So with timeout set, all you're getting is a failure sooner. That might not be very helpful. There's two other things you might want to do. Um, 
retries are pretty handy. Uh, if the first one fails, you, uh, you can just try again, or you can try multiple times. This is really useful, but you might not want to do this on a very upscale system, a very, like, uh, very upstream system. If it's, um, if it's a back-end system that other apps talk to, you might not want to have it sitting there trying again, trying again, trying again. You might want to do this on front-end applications or systems that are quite close to the, to the front-end. Um, because retries can take quite a long time. If they take one second and they try three times, that means they wasted th uh, three seconds. We, we started using retries at work because once we started implementing timeouts, all it meant was our stuff just failed a lot. <laughs> it wasn't taking as long to fail, but it was still failing. Um, and you can do the math like this. Service A has to talk to four different systems. Um, each one of those has a timeout of two, and it will retry twice, which means it's doing three attempts in total. That means, if you do all the math, it's taking 24 seconds just to try and do its job. So that's a lot of time waiting for stuff, and you might not want to do that. So a third thing that's pretty useful, um, even when you have timeouts, and even if you don't use retries, with a timeout of one second, you're still waiting a second for something that may or may not work. Um, if you have you know, loads of threads that are trying to make a request to something that's currently down, you're still waiting a second to find out that it's down. Why would you bother wa wasting that one second if you could just flip a switch and say, hey, we know this service is down, let's just not talk to it for a while, and hopefully that will give it a bit of a chance to calm down, or the developer will come fix it, or the, you know, the back pressure will at least mean that it, it's not um, struggling as much, and maybe it will come back. So for that, sir, for that functionality, you can use this concept called circuit breakers. Uh, Martin Fowler has got a really good article on this, which is usually the story for anything. Um, and this fancy little diagram kind of shows you what it's talking about. Um, you have a client, it goes through the circuit breaker. Um, the circuit breaker can be Ruby, it can be Redis, it can just be code, it can be uh, loads of different things. And it talks to the uh, dependency, an error comes back, and that error is sent to the client. So that's just the normal flow. After that, after a certain number of errors have been triggered, um, it's basically going to just short circuit that request and say, don't even bother. The circuit breaker says it's dead, so screw it. Um, so with circuit breakers in place, it should look a bit more like this. We'll get, uh, when someone hits the OK endpoint, they get perfectly good functionality. When someone hits the slow endpoint, they might get a slow response there but then the circuit breaker is going to kick in, and those slow responses don't affect the entire rest of the application. So you can implement code br uh, circuit breakers in a couple of different ways. You can use code-based circuit breakers, and there's a really good one for all of you no Ruby users out there um, called uh, CircuitBox, which is made by Yammer. We use this at WeWork a lot. And it's just a, a middleware that you can inject into your HTTP client, and uh, it will just it shows you, it does what that diagram does. It just it uses Redis as a store, and then it will basically say, this one's hit a certain threshold, don't bother talking to it for a while, and then you can come back and use it later. Another option which is getting more popular these days, and is another talk in itself, is to use a service mesh. Anyone here using a service mesh? Like three people. We all need to start using them. If you use microservices, you need to use a service mesh. Um, service mesh takes into consideration all this sort of stuff that I've been talking about and means you don't need to learn about it. <laughs> so you can just install service meshes. The problem we have at WeWork is that trying to teach 100 plus developers all of this complicated stuff about networks um, and, and how your application interacts over the network shouldn't be necessary. It's, it's a hard job to teach that many developers that much stuff, all about timeouts, retries, circuit breakers, and all the math involved in getting it done. Um, it's a really hard job, and, and service meshes are designed to take care of most of this stuff for you. Um, Envoy and Istio are two common options. And, um, oh yeah, just to introduce the, the, the basic point of it. Um, it's a network communication infrastructure, which allows you to take the kind of network-based logic out of your application code and put it into more like infrastructure-y stuff. Um, so usually it runs as a sidecar, it's a process on, on the server the application exists on, and you send your uh, requests into that and it will proxy them off somewhere else. And that means you have a lot of um, wiggle room and ability to add functionality into that, uh, into that service mesh. So a common one is Envoy. Um, they have a great guide. I'll put these slides up and um, tweet them at API days. 
Um, and there's also something called Istio, which still isn't really performance ready, uh, production ready. We're going to start using it at WeWork, but we're, our kind of rollout plan is kind of in line with when they will hopefully be production ready. Um, but Envoy is a very low level traffic system where you have to kind of do a lot of bare bones work yourself, whereas Istio kind of layers on top of that and adds circuit breaking and other functionality um, in more of a kind of plug and play kind of way. Um, but yeah, there's, there's circuit breaking on the front end as well is something that I'm quite interested in at WeWork because there's, there's a few situations like if one service crashes, then like multiple other services crash and then you can't even look at the website. <laughs> well, not, like the, not, the, not the homepage, but you know, our um, social network. And they're working a lot on that. And it used to be the case that people would make one giant request to try and fetch all of the data, right? That's the selling point of GraphQL. Make this one massive request that gives you everything. And then if that one thing breaks, you don't get anything, right? So that's not really very helpful. You want to be making multiple requests to multiple services from your front end. That's not a bug. That's a feature. That's the whole point of service-based architecture. And so what's pretty cool on the front end, uh, while I was trying to do this talk, I was trying to find parking for uh, the airport. And um, it was the website was a little bit broken. And I noticed that it changed in how it was broken. So much so that I took a screenshot of this and tweeted about it and then forgot to book my car parking spot for the airport. Um, <laughs> but basically, when you try and click on map view, it says map view is currently unavailable at this time. It took a few seconds to show up. But clearly, it was while I was on there um, trying to click on it, it was trying to load the map service in the background and it failed, so it showed me this error message. Then, later on, I went back to it and it was just gone. Because it knew the map service was down, it basically just hid the option. There, you, know, you can look at it in list view, but there's no map service right now, so why even show the button? And you want your front ends to be um, reactive in this way. Um, for more about front end stuff and how uh, you can all, all of the content of this is in a new book that I'm working on called Surviving Other People's APIs. Um, and it's about kind of interacting with APIs that somebody else or you in a different life wrote um, as opposed to building APIs. So it's the opposite of the last book. Um, there's a coupon code if you buy it from LeanPub, which is API Days 2018. And um, I think I might have a couple of minutes for questions, but probably not too many. Thank you.